to take as my starting point tonight, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, pursue peace with all and pursue the holiness or sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. What can we do to draw out the true meaning of this verse and uh, this idea of holiness just a little bit? Because holiness is another area of many where there have been some major misunderstandings in the Christian church over the years. And especially in our generation, when most churches avoid the topic of holiness like the plague. Now, one of the reasons for this bad name in our generation is that different holiness teachings uh, developed a bad reputation over the years. And even myself, one of my first interactions with a holiness church was when I was traveling with a Christian drama, drama group in the early 80s. And we were down south somewhere in the east side of the country at a Baptist school trying to bring our Christian drama into that school. And uh, the head man refused to allow us to perform because a couple of us, including my hair, was half an inch longer than their standard. Or maybe a quarter of an inch, I don't know. I couldn't really tell the difference, but he insisted my hair was too long and bad of a couple of the other guys. And I still remember the way that that guy sneered at me, and he looked at my hair like this as if, you know, with just a little bit more effort, he'd smack me across the face. What kind of spirit was that? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> well, I promise you that attitude has nothing to do with biblical holiness except maybe for the verse in Isaiah 65, verse 5, that says, Those who say, keep to yourself, do not approach me. In other words, keep away from me. For I am sanctified or set apart from you, or as some translate this verse, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostril, a fire burning all the day. Well, that doesn't sound too good to be a smoke in the nostril of God, you know. <laughs> to make God that angry day after day that the smoke is pouring out, you know. Well, some of these old-time holiness groups had regulations about dress length, about hairstyles, about clothing, about jewelry, even whether or not you could wear wedding rings, and on and on the lists went. Now, I'm not saying that care in clothing is a bad thing. Even in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God gave some very direct and specific instructions about clothing that was to be worn such as the garments, even the undergarments of the priests, the fringe and the tassels on the cloak of the ordinary Israelite. And the New Testament, too, counsels women especially to be modest in what they wear. As it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. And Paul talks about the length of hair in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, both for men and for women. But for some reason, when these things become too much of a focus of the teaching, and especially when a lot of man-made regulations are added to it, it easily degenerates into this holier-than-thou attitude that God hates, in which people think they're right with God just because of what they're wearing or not wearing. And this is exactly what Jesus criticized the Pharisees for. In Matthew 23, verse 25, he said, You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Or as the Pharisee said in Jesus' famous parable, going to the temple to pray, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men. Well, <clears throat> holiness is not supposed to be a way to see yourself as being better than others. But nor, on the other side, is true holiness some kind of a mystical essence that can be transmitted to you from a holy person or a holy object by touching it or by wearing it. This is part of the idea behind the holy relics that were such a rage in Christianity for so many hundreds of years and are even in some places today. For example, when David was a baby, of course you don't remember this, David, but we were in the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and this old Christian lady just picked him up out of his stroller and rubbed him against the icon that stands in the place where Jesus' cross once stood. Now, I have no idea why she did this, 
She didn't speak any language that we knew, so we couldn't talk to her about it. I'm supposing she thought it would bestow some kind of a blessing on him or on us or something like that. In the Philippines every year, a couple of people are trampled to death when the crowd rushes to touch their handkerchiefs against a certain idol that's brought out of one of the churches on a certain festival day. And the idea then is to bring that handkerchief back to somebody who's sick so they'll be healed. Well, it is true that in the Bible, God healed people through handkerchiefs and aprons that the Apostle Paul had touched in Acts chapter 19, verse 12. In the Old Testament, a dead man was brought back to life when he touched the bones of the prophet Elisha. But while healing and miracles are wonderful, gracious works of God, being healed or receiving some kind of a touch from God does not necessarily or automatically make you holy. Nor even does praying for somebody and seeing them get healed necessarily mean that you are holy. And Jesus specifically warns us about those who prophesy and do miracles in his name, yet lead lawless, in other words, sinful lives. As it says in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? In the end, Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Well, what I'm trying to point out is that holiness and let's say healing, for example, are two completely different things. While healing is something that can be transferred directly from one person to another, ultimately, of course, from God, holiness cannot be transferred like this from one person to another, at least not biblical holiness. And this is an issue that's directly addressed in the Bible in Haggai chapter 2, verse 12. I know we don't get into Haggai very often, so we'll treasure the moment when we can do that. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 12, it's, the translation is there in your notes. It says, if a man carries holy meat, now this is meat that's been sanctified by contact with the temple in some way. If a man carries holy meat in the wing or corner of his garment, in other words, the corner of his cloak, and with his corner, the corner of his garment, he touches to the bread and to the stew or to the wine or to the oil or to any food, is it made holy? Does contact with the holy make the object which is contacted, holy. And the priest answered and said, no. What is holy, in other words, cannot communicate that holiness to something else by simply touching it, by just having contact with it. On the other side, though, as he goes on to say in the next verse, in Haggai 2, verse 13, if one who is unclean of soul, that is to say unclean because of contact with the physical contact with the dead, which is a source of uncleanness in the Hebrew Bible. If one who is unclean of soul touches any of these, any of those foods, is it unclean? And the priests answered and said, it's unclean. So while ritual holiness cannot be communicated by touch, ritual uncleanness can be communicated by touch. Why is that? Well, because biblical holiness is not a substance that can be communicated. It is instead the standing of a person in a relationship, a right relationship with God and with the covenantal guidelines, the rules, the laws that God has established. Now, in one of its most primary senses of meaning, holiness means simply the opposite of sinning or sin. That is to say, if you're holy, you don't do sin, you don't do lawlessness. So that means holiness is a submission to God and to his word, to his covenant, doing what God said that we should do and avoiding what God said we should not do. And this is basically covenantal obedience. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, as well as the Old Testament, this covenantal obedience is a primary part of having a relationship with God. As it says in Hebrews, the first verse that we started off with, pursue peace with all and pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now remember, we're not talking about how you get into a relationship with God. That's different. We're talking about how we live once we're in that relationship with God, once we've been accepted by faith and grace and all that kind of thing. I want to look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. 
says, therefore, having these promises, all the wonderful, great promises of God, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh or body and spirit, which will bring about a result in holiness in the fear of God. What is it that we're called all through the New Testament? Saints, right? Holy ones is what it means. That's who we are called to be in Christ. And what is the powerful, or who is the powerful one dwelling in us who makes this possible? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness. That's why he's called holy, to bring that holiness into our lives. But even he doesn't do this just by his presence, just by a touch. Rather, as it says in Romans 8, 26, he prays for us, he intercedes for us. And let's read that in Romans 8, 26. But in the same way, the Spirit also comes to help our weakness. For we do not know what is necessary to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes with sighs or groans that cannot be expressed in words. Even the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, cannot make us holy simply by being in us. But he can help us to obey God by praying for us. I kind of like to think of it like that picture of Moses in the desert when they were having that battle with the Amalekites. And, uh, you know, the, the guys were holding up Moses' arms. You know, the Holy Spirit is there to, as it were, hold up our arms to help us to persevere in prayer. And look how Paul continues in that same section in Romans chapter 8 there. It goes immediately into that verse, which is one of the favorites of all of us, Romans 8, 28. But we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his plan. And we often stop there. But in Greek, it continues, the same sentence continues in verse 29, that those whom he knew in advance and foreordained, having the same form of the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Let's break that down a little bit. What are these things? That, you know, Paul lays out these incredibly heavy things, rapid fire. He says, those who, okay, we called according to his plan, that those whom he knew in advance, God's foreknowledge of us, that God knew us before the foundation of the world, as it says specifically in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and foreordained, as it says also in Ephesians 1, that God predestined us to adoption to himself through Jesus. This is all the plan of God from before the foundation of the world. It had your name on it. It wasn't some generic thing. Uh, there's going to be some group. I'll, let's see, I'll raise up some group, uh, and I'll do this and that. No, he had your name there. He knew specifically all about you before the foundation of the world. What's more, having the same form of the image of his son. Now, it doesn't just say having the same form as his son, which would mean being human like us, but having the same form of the image and this word, ikonos in Greek, or image, refers back to the image of God, the divine image in Genesis chapter 1. And Paul breaks out this beautiful idea for us a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, when he says, But we all, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord with unveiled face, are being transformed, or it's transfigured, the same word as in Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as we are being transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. Now think about that. I mean, we could really just dwell on that for the whole evening. We looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? Looking at Jesus as in a mirror with unveiled face, referring to his previous thing about Moses and the veil, are being transformed into the same image. We are being transformed into that image we look at. We look at Jesus as it were in a mirror, and that his image is what God is making us to be more and more like day after day after day after day, as the Holy Spirit is working in us. That's the transformation. Jesus had his transfiguration. We're having our transfiguration, becoming more and more into the image of Jesus. Wow, what an amazing a little concept is locked in that one verse. But uh, we have to get down to definitions a little bit more again. What really is holiness? 
Because in the Gentile church, under the influence of Gnosticism and Neoplatonism and Greek philosophy and all these things, holiness came to be seen as something otherworldly, something that's disconnected from every day, you know, waking up in the morning and, and uh, changing the diapers on the kids and, uh, you know, getting in the vehicle and driving to work. I mean, holiness was something removed from the everyday. In the Greek and Roman worldview, the realm of the gods was far above that of mankind, separated from it. In fact, you can even see in some of the old paintings that come to us from that time that, you know, the gods are up here, and sometimes there's even like a little line up in the sky somewhere, and then underneath is the realm of men, two separate realms that rarely interact with one another. And this view of reality with the realm of the holy up there and the realm of the mundane or even unholy down here, this radical disconnect between these two things is one of the reasons why philosophically and even linguistically, even in terms of language, it was very hard for the Greeks to express the idea that God became a man. It was like saying the impossible, because God is up there and man is down here. How can God become man? It just didn't work. So this is why they had so much trouble defining this in Greek philosophy, and they ended up having so many persecutions and excommunications and church splits over defining exactly how did God become man. Because to Greek and Roman thinking, godness and manness were so radically different and separate categories, such radically different and separate realms, that it was impossible even to express the idea that God can become a man, and they never did really completely succeed. To contact this otherworldly realm of the divine, pagan Romans and Greeks would go to places, holy places, that were seen to be points of contact between this world and that world. For instance, uh, one of the places they would think of as a contact point like that is caves where water came up out of the ground, you know, from a hidden source. The, a gate to the underworld, just like at Banias in Israel, which in Jesus' day was called Caesarea Philippi. It was seen to be a meeting place of the mundane world and the supernatural world. And so many pagan temple, temples were built there beside the cave which has the water flowing out. And this is what Jesus was referring to when up on one of the surrounding hillsides, he said in Matthew 16, verse 18, the gates of Hades... That is to say, the gates of the underworld of the dead, of which Caesarea Philippi was seen as one of the entrances, will not prevail against the church. In other words, those gates will not be able to stop the church. The church is going to bust through those gates and rise from the death. Death, that is to say, in a short form, will not hold us back. But pagan Romans would go to these holy sites to try to have an experience of the divine, to make contact with the radically other world of the gods. Even if it was in a city, a pagan temple was a place that was set apart, had courtyard around it, and it was a place that was seen as being quite different than the ordinary world of daily life. But this idea of the holy as other and out there is radically different. In fact, you could call it the opposite of the biblical view of holiness. Because the biblical view, and I'm not saying the traditional Christian view, because the traditional Christian view has been very influenced by the Roman view, but the biblical view of holiness is not a disconnect from everyday reality in which you try to make contact with this distant realm, but rather it is to awaken to the presence of God right here and right now in the ordinary, everyday world and to make room for him in your life in that everyday world. Completely different view of things. Now, the reason that people are easily mistaken or, or misled in this area, just don't get it, is because uh, biblical holiness also calls for separation. In fact, the root of holiness in Hebrew means separation. But the biblical idea of separation is completely different than that of pagan religion. And I shouldn't just say the Romans. I mean, it's still true of pagan religion today. Biblical holiness does not call for contact 
with that other realm, but rather as a way of responding to the living God who is right here and right now. In other words, to separate yourself from, from the way of the world by adopting a lifestyle that is open to and in tune with God. And you don't have to do this on a mountaintop someplace. It can be done anywhere, even in a busy marketplace with all kinds of non-believers around you. In the one view of spirituality and holiness, you withdraw from the world in the attempt to contact God. And this came right over in the Christian church. We have all the monks and the nuns going out to these places to try to develop a spiritual life because spiritual was looked at as different than the world, and so you had to get away from the world to do it. And so they went to these distant places, up on mountaintops, you had to get to by rope ladders and all kinds of uh, wild ways to separate themselves. Well, they had the word separate right, but they didn't have the meaning of the word right. Because in the biblical view of things, you, to have a spiritual experience, you don't go away from the world. To have a spiritual experience, you go to the world. To put it in terms of our Christian uh, thing, you know, I mean, you go to the sinner to share Jesus with him, and in that contact, God shows up. You go to the sick to help them, and in that contact, God shows up. You go to the persecuted person or that person in jail and to minister them, and God shows up. You meet God when you do what he says, when you reach out to a lost and a hurting world. It's a completely different view of what spirituality is, is all about. In one, holiness is based on how you feel. And you're looking for that spiritual feeling. And if you don't have that feeling, then you don't think about spirituality. You don't talk about spirituality. It depends on how you feel. In the other view, the biblical view, holiness is based not on how you feel, but on what you do. Whether you're doing what God wants you to do or you're not doing what God wants you to do. And of course, when you do what God wants you to do, it will produce a feeling, a good feeling, because you're doing what God wants you to do, and you're closer to God, and you'll feel the presence of God, but it's, it's a different order of things. And this is a very, very important difference that we need to understand, because really the church doesn't get it even until today. How many people go to church and they're looking for a feeling, an experience? You know, we had a, a, in our church in the Philippines one time some some people who had come to our church a few times went to another church and they said, oh, we felt goosebumps over there when something was happening, you know. So we're going over to that church. Okay, <laughs> goodbye. I mean, you know, they were running after a feeling. And a lot of churches today are built on feelings. They, everything in this church is calculated to get a certain feeling, a mood, presence of something spiritual to people. And if that's your only goal, that's paganism. That's not biblical religion. Because biblical religion is pursuing God in a covenant relationship, which means being faithful to that covenant. And when you are faithful to the covenant, the presence of God will come into your life, and it won't be such an up-and-down thing here today, gone tomorrow, but a constant, abiding, deep-rooted presence of God in your life. So this is a difference that we need to look out for even in the church today. We still haven't quite exactly got it. And to get it, we need to turn to the Old Testament in some areas that have been basically ignored by the Christian church. And that has to do with some of the separation laws that are in the Old Testament for the Israelites. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were set apart to God by the commandments of the law. And such simple things as not eating pork or shelled seafood and the other food laws made a distinction, a division, a separation between Israel and the other nations. It didn't mean they had to go to a distant island. They could be right there with everybody else and were always. But there was a distinction in how they lived their lives. Now, if you've ever studied some of these laws, the food laws, you know, can't eat this kind of vulture and rabbit and on and on and on it goes. Uh, a lot of people, both Jews and Christians, have tried to analyze them in terms of health or hygiene and have come up with some explanations that are very 
uh, convincing, you know. You know, after all, pork, you can get trichinosis, and back in those days, they didn't have proper refrigeration, and, uh, you know, it would be a good idea not to eat the pork. And uh, you can go on and on like that. I mean, people have written whole books about this, which are fascinating to read. But the problem is, whatever system of interpretation you come up with, it never seems to be able to apply to every case. And so you always come up short. And ultimately, as the rabbis themselves teach, it comes down to one thing and one thing alone. That God chose to distinguish his people from all the others on the face of the earth. So it really doesn't matter if there's a logical reason that we can understand or not. What matters is that whatever it is, this is how God chose to set his people apart. And this wasn't just through the food laws, of course, but through the whole of the Mosaic Covenant. God made his people different than all others. He separated them from the surrounding nations, and he drew them to himself by means of his commandments, as it says in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. And now, if you will listen attentively to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be to me a precious possession more than any of the other peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And again, this separation did not at all mean that they were to have nothing to do with the other nations. In fact, just the opposite. They were to be a testimony to the nations, a light to the nations. There would be priests to the nations. And uh, not just nations in the abstract, but even at the moment when God was delivering this from Mount Sinai, there stood among them this huge mixed multitude that we've been talking about. The Gentiles were right there already that they were supposed to breed priests to and intermediaries to draw them to God. Israel itself, you know, wasn't in some kind of isolated place. Israel in ancient times before airplanes, you know, was on the road between Africa and Europe and Asia. If you wanted to go back and forth between those continents without going into a boat, you went through Israel. They were on the highway, the highway of ancient times, with all kinds of people moving through constantly back and forth. Why? Because God wanted exposure for them. He wanted people to see them. He wanted people to interact with them. So the separation we're talking about is not a geographical separation, but it's a separation of a distinctiveness and it was especially strong at the family and personal level. A different way of doing some of the most basic things in life because of their relationship with God. Something, things you just couldn't miss. Well, this idea of separation from the ways of the world is a key idea in the Old Testament. And the Jewish people have absorbed it very beautifully over the years. And I'd like to reflect that by uh, saying for you the beautiful blessing which is said at the end of the Sabbath. You know, they have a little uh, thing that they do when the Sabbath is over. And, you know, you smell some uh, uh, scents, uh, fragrant herbs. Uh, they have a candle burning. Uh, you drink a cup of juice or wine. And uh, this is the blessing that they say at that time. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. You recognize that first part already from some of the things we've done. All the blessings begin the same way who makes a division between the sacred and the secular, between light and darkness, between Israel and the other nations, between the Sabbath and the six working days. What a beautiful and a profound insight into the ways of God, that he introduces distinctions and separations for his purposes, both in the natural order as well in his, as in his instructions for human life, in his word. And Christians have basically not got this, you know. So we too are called to be separate. But that doesn't mean to slam the door in the face of somebody else and get away from me because I'm holy, which is the attitude that unfortunately a lot of us take time to time, a lot of times without even thinking about it. The yeah. And for this, I'd just like to look at 2 Corinthians 6, because I, I, I just want to finish up here. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and following, verse 16. But what agreement is there for the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. 
As God said, I will dwell among them and walk about among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And this is what I kind of want to use to tie up my thoughts, and that's that this idea of we are the temple, that God wants to dwell here in us every day, in day in, day out, is the exact opposite of the pagan religious view of God. God wants to be with us, but the way in which that can happen is through us being holy. cannot be where there is unholiness. He, he, he just can't go there. He abhors it. So the way that we provide a place where God can come and dwell with us is through obedience. Not through how we feel, not through those other kind of things, but through simple obedience. And that permits God to come and to dwell there and to remain there. And that's what God is calling us to. The picture was first through the temple. You know, that little tent in the middle of their camp, he wanted to be there with them. He wanted to go around with them. Uh, Jesus is taking that up another level. There he is walking with us, talking. This is what God wants to do, to be with us all the time. That's his heart. He doesn't want to be separated by us through infinite eons of space. He wants to be here. And uh, that's how the whole idea of holiness in the Bible is so radically different than concepts of paganism back then or even today. And just to finish up this section, verse 17, Therefore come out from the midst of them and be separate or set apart, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And just going on to verse 18, And I will be to you a father, and you will be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He wants that familial relationship uh, there uh, with us together. He wants us to be saints. That does not mean some kind of glowing figure that's half human, you know, on top of a pillar or something. Uh, It simply means being available for God and being obedient to God and welcoming God right into your everyday working world, the the screaming and yelling and the telephone ringing and whatever it is, that's where God wants to be. That's where he longs to be. And that's what being truly separated means. It doesn't mean being cut off. It means being changed in our relationship to God, open to God.